Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Iglesias. I'm the uh, director for the Wheaton Center for Faith, Politics, and Economics. We also want to thank our co-sponsor, the newest center on Wheaton College, which is a center for faith and innovation, for their support in this as well. So if this is your first uh, event of ours, uh, we seek to advance the benefits of market economies, limited government, and the representative democracies through our uniquely Christian worldview. We're privileged to partner with a major Washington think tank and influencer, the American Enterprise Institute, also known as AEI. And uh, we have a deep appreciation for the excellence of their work, for the many interns that uh, they have hosted over the years, and uh, we uh, want to thank them for their generously sharing their time, talents, and treasure. AEI's work is rooted in the belief in democracy, free enterprise, American strength, and global leadership, solidarity with those at the periphery of our society, and a pluralistic entrepreneurial culture. AEI seeks actively and encourages engagement with those who hold different points of view. Now, following this lecture, there will be time for Q&A. Please fill out your questions on the three and a half by five cards, which should be in front of you. And we'll have ushers you can give your questions to. After uh, Arthur Brooks' comments, there will be books on sale in the lobby. And uh, Dr. Brooks has indicated he will stay and sign some of those. In the many years I've had the honor of introducing distinguished guests, I don't ever recall using the term Renaissance man to describe someone. Tonight, however, it's fitting that I use that term since Arthur Brooks is a jazz musician, best-selling author of 11 books on the role of government, economic opportunity, happiness, the morality of free enterprise, a podcast host, a Washington Post columnist, and president of the American Enterprise Institute. He received his BA in economics from the Thomas Edison State College, master's in economics from Florida Atlantic, and his PhD in policy analysis from the Pardee Rand Graduate School. A native of the Emerald City, Seattle, He's been married 27 years to his wife, Esther. They have three children. This summer, Arthur will be joining the faculty at the Kennedy School of Government and the Harvard Business School. Tonight, Dr. Brooks will be speaking about his latest book, Love Your Enemies. Since the God of the Bible is a God of love, and it is our command to love God and our neighbors, we all look forward to hearing these remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving Dr. Arthur Brooks a warm Wheaton College welcome. Thank you, David. Thank you, sir. Thank you so very much for that gracious and warm welcome. What, what a delight it is to be here. Um, I've been looking forward to this. This is a, a school that has a special place in my family history. And before I start, I also want to mention that, that uh, my you know, beloved executive assistant, Heavy Gadera, is a graduate from two years ago of Wheaton College, two years ago, and has been with me, and, and I'm really grateful for her work with me at AEI. We employ a lot of... A lot of Wheaton graduates work at AEI, and, and the reason is because there's something special about this place. A lot of values, uh, a sense of hard work, uh, an adherence to mission, and you know, I've always loved it because I've always heard about it. I didn't go to college here. I barely went to college at all. <laughs> I'm lucky to get a college degree. I graduated from college a month before my 30th birthday, as a matter of fact. I would have loved to have come to a, an institution like this. The reason that I have a special place in my heart for this is because my grandfather, uh, Charles C. Brooks, was the, was the dean of students here for 10 years between 1943 and 1953. Um, he was also a graduate of Wheaton College, a uh, class of 1915. His oldest daughter, my aunt, Marie Brooks, was a, an, uh, a, a on-again, off-again date of Billy Graham, <laughs> class of 1944. And my father grew up on Irving Street, about one block from here, and he passed away a long time ago, and my only regret is he could not have lived long enough to see the Cubs as a winning team. <laughs> Thank you very much for the role that Wheaton College has played in the, the, role, the, the, the role that it's played in my family, in, uh, in my own imagination. And my, my dad and my, my grandfather and my whole family, uh, they'd be really pleased that, I, that I'm here tonight talking to you. I'm going to talk to you tonight about this latest book you heard about. It's called Love Your Enemies. Uh, it's a book that I, I released about three weeks ago. 
And it's, it's been fun traveling around the country, talking about loving your enemies as if I had made up that phrase. <laughs> you know, in a secular country, when I, learn, like, when I run a secular institution, but deep in my heart, I'm just trying to do apostolic work. The incredible thing is that you can quote the words of the master and people think you're being clever. <laughs> it's just Matthew 544, man. <laughs> And yet so, so many people don't know it, and that's a huge opportunity for all of us. And you all know this too, doing apostolic work. You know that your secular vocations are actually priestly vocations, and that you have an opportunity to actually bring people in, in the newest sense to the oldest wisdom. That's what I'm trying to do in this book. I'm going to go a little bit outside of the walls of this book because I get to speak at this really fine college. Um, I want to talk less just about loving your enemies, and I want to talk more about just love tonight. And I want to tell you why I'm going to talk to you about the subject of love per se. You know, many of you, how many of you are students? How many of you are students? Okay, let's say two-thirds. And uh, those of you who aren't students, were students someplace, some point in your life. You had a great mentor. Those of you who are here at Wheaton College, you can think of your favorite professor, somebody who's had a tremendous influence on you. You can think of somebody who has helped show you the way morally and intellectually. Um, I had somebody like that in my life, too. Uh, it was a professor. His name was James Q. Wilson. Those of you who never heard of him, he was maybe the greatest political scientist of the past 75 years. And I'm not a political scientist, but he had a huge influence on me. I didn't meet him when I was in my, doing my undergraduate education. It's when I did my PhD. He came in at the very end. Uh, he sat in on my dissertation defense, which went just horribly poorly. And, but he was sitting in, and afterward he came up to me and he said, I see a lot of promise here. Give me a call. And so as I left, you know, by the grace of God and my committee, I got my PhD, and I went out into the world, and I became an academic. I was a professor. I started asking him for advice. He was a famous man. He was a professor at Harvard for many years and later at UCLA. His, his theories and his books really changed a lot of American society. He wrote a famous book called Bureaucracy that changed the way that a lot of cities govern themselves. He, he, he wrote a famous paper called The Broken Windows Theory of Criminal Justice that, that determined the way that, that Rudy Giuliani became the mayor of New York City. And he wrote a very famous book called The Moral Sense that showed the evidence that people are innately wired with morality as if there were a force behind it all. Imagine that. What could it be? <laughs> so Jim Wilson, James Q. Wilson, <clears throat> um, he wrote the foreword to my first book when I, was a, when I was still an assistant professor, my first commercial book. Uh, just out of pure generosity, he did that. He, he also gave me this in, incredibly good advice. You know, at, at early on, uh, when I was just coming up for tenure, I was writing some articles for the Wall Street Journal on the side, and, and I, was, I became identified as somebody who was politically kind of conservative, which in academia is a dangerous business. So I was giving a lecture someplace, and somebody held up a Wall Street Journal article that I had written that said, you know, something that was mildly economically conservative, and, and, and I got protested <laughs> at this lecture I was giving. It was just the time I was coming up for tenure, and just this, this, this the terror, you know, this like this chill went down my spine. Is this going to ruin my career? So I called up my great mentor, James Q. Wilson. I said, Jim, I just got protested because of my political views. What do I do if I'm going to be a conservative in academia? And he said, don't worry about it. Simple. It's a simple formula. I said, tell me the formula. He said, you have to be twice as productive and four times as nice as the liberals. <laughs> In other words, hold yourself to higher standards, which is incredibly good advice, too. Well, you know, the, uh, the, last pe the last piece of advice, the last bit of wisdom he gave me not long before he died, is he said that, you know, we've been working together on public policy. I'm a public policy analyst. His public policy was his big area. Policy, economic policy, social policy, education policy, health policy, 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 government. He said, you know, you know the dirty little secret about public policy? I said, what? What is it, Jim? This is the master I'm talking to. What is it? He says, it never affects people at more than the 5% margin of their lives. I said, Jim, you could have told me that before I got a PhD in public policy, <laughs> right? <laughs> then I asked, what's the other 95%? And he said, mostly love. 
It's really the dark matter of our lives is love, the parts that we don't understand. But that's what motivates us, that makes us do what we do. It's what gives us our satisfactions. He said, we can talk about policy all we want. We can pretend it's 100%. We can ask the government to do that or ask corporations to do this. We can pretend that all these policies are going to affect people, but they really don't. What people are motivated by is their hearts. That love is what we need to understand better. That's why the last book he wrote was the one I referred to before called The Moral Sense. This is the guy who had been running regression analyses and doing statistical work his whole career. And in the end, he wrote about morals because that's what really matters the most. And that was really the last advice he gave me was to spend my career thinking about what matters most. Now, that's actually something I should have known, you know? Love is at the center of my life. I'm a Christian. I've dedicated my life to, you know, the life of others. I've dedicated my own life, or at least I think I did, I have, to get to heaven and take as many people with me as I can. Why would I not pay attention to the thing that matters the most in Christ's witness to me and my witness to others, which is love? So that's what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about this 95% of life and life. Now, is it true that these matters of the heart really matter the most? I've been looking at these data recently that are blowing my mind a little bit. I've been looking at data going back to about the year 2006. And I have these Gallup polling data from the Gallup polling organization that asks people about how happy they are by asking, are you thriving? That's a really interesting question, right? Are you thriving? It's not how happy are you, how joyful are you at this particular moment. Are you thriving in your life? Which means basically, you know, look, you got your ups and downs, but all things considered, how's your life going? And then it, it measures that across the population and it looks at the trend. And from 2006 until this year, the percentage of people who say they're thriving has moved from 62% of the population to 50%. Now, this is not because of the Great Recession. That happened at the very beginning of those trends. It's been trending down and trending down. Fewer and pe fewer people say they're thriving, ordinary Americans. Maybe it's the economy. Well, GDP per capita during the same period has gone from $46,000 per person to $57,000 per person. Every quintile has gotten richer. Every part of the population has gotten more prosperous. And every part of the population, especially young people, are less and less likely to say they're thriving. You know there's no policy that closes that gap. The 5% isn't going to get it done. In your heart, you know the problem is in your heart. So what are we going to do about that? How can we bring our expertise to bear? How can I, as an economist, dig into that? That's my goal tonight, to talk about what we can do, those of us who are members of the Christian family, but who have higher education and expertise to bring it to bear on what matters the most and that can lift people up and bring them together. Love. Well, let's start by talking a little bit about... <clears throat> how love and policy meet. <laughs> I'll tell you a very interesting case study. It's something I learned a couple of years ago that's been kind of on my mind. Um, where we thought we had a huge policy problem and it turned out we had a love problem in our society. So I'm gonna turn back the clock a little bit to 1969, the Vietnam War. The Rand Corporation, a big think tank in, in, in Los Angeles, where I worked for a number of years, the Rand Corporation did a big study of U.S. troops in Vietnam in 1969, and they came to a shocking conclusion. They were trying to figure out why there was so much ineffectiveness of these highly trained American forces. And the answer, to no small extent, was because of drug use. The, the, this study found that 20% of American GIs on active duty in Vietnam, 20% were addicted to heroin. Heroin was plentiful, and heroin was cheap, and they were taking it like crazy. One in five American GIs, 50% had tried heroin, and 20% were addicted to heroin. Now, this is catastrophic. Why? Because heroin is literally the most addictive substance on the planet. We don't really know very well how to get people de-addicted from heroin. We, st we really didn't know in 1969. Now, the Nixon administration also saw that in American cities and communities all over the United States, there was a heroin boom coming. More and more people were using heroin in, in the United States. And, and they knew that a bunch of GIs were about to come home from Vietnam, and this thing was going to just, just, just gonna explode. 
So they've got a whole bunch of experts together from the think tanks, from the academic community. To, what are we going to do? What are the policy solutions for the coming heroin epidemic? They put a bunch of things in place, but they were kind of scratching their heads. They didn't know what to do. They braced themselves. The guys came home and nothing happened. Why not? Because 90% of the heroin addicts got home and stopped using heroin on their first day. And only 5% relapsed within a year. What had happened? And the answer is, they came back to a life that had love in it. Have any of you ever talked to a heroin addict? I have. I've talked to people who've been addicted to opiates. And, and by the way, that's a big number. Compared to 1969 or 1972 was the, the, the worst year of the heroin epidemic in the early 1970s. We have 10 times as many people dying of heroin overdoses per capita this year than we did in 1972. That's how bad the, the, the opioid epidemic is in the United States today. If you ever talk to somebody who's addicted to opioids, the one thing that they'll say, because I've asked them before, I'll say, what does heroin feel like? It sounds like a kind of a prurient question. It seems like a quite an indecent question. But I want to know, because that's got to be the answer to why you do it. So what does it feel like? You know, one guy told me, it feels like being surrounded in liquid love. It feels like pure love. That's why it feels so good. That's the only way he could explain it. Well, the heroin addicts that had come home from Vietnam, they got the real thing and didn't need the liquid love anymore. And they had no idea this was going to happen. It was, a, it was a miracle. It was a crisis that didn't happen because of relationships, because of marriages, because of parents, because of children, <laughs> because of all the things that every single person in this auditorium takes for granted. It's incredible. It was a big mystery. Now, there's a the old idea that, that love is better than policy and love sorts out the problems in our lives. This is a case study that kind of proves that, but there's nothing new. You know, I, was, I came across this recently, I just remembered this, probably when I was in high school, actually. Many of you remember Shakespeare's 29th sonnet. It's just part of it. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I alone beweep my outcast state. Happily I think on thee, for thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings that then I scorn to change my state with kings. <laughs> love solves your problems. Bottom line. That was poetry in the year 1609. That was a policy mystery in the year 1969. And it's the subject of science today. We know what was going on now. And let me tell you. There is a, uh, a neurotransmitter, a hormone, that's, that's, that's produced by the brain. It's also known as the love molecule, oxytocin. We've been learning about this more and more progressively over the past 15 or 20 years. Researchers have been finding that, that when you see somebody that you love, when you see your beloved or, or a close friend or a family member you haven't seen in a long time, your brain produces oxytocin. It's what binds you to other people with these special bonds that you just can't quite explain. The, 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 the strongest example of when you get oxytocin in your brain, and every single one of your brains produces oxytocin. You know when you get it the most? is when you look in the eyes of your newborn baby. It's when, when, when I was uh, in graduate school, uh, in my last year of graduate school, finishing my dissertation, and defending my dissertation, and, and I was working 16 hours a day, and my wife was super pregnant with our first child. And, and I wasn't getting enough sleep, and I wasn't thinking rationally. And, and I remember thinking, because I was a, you know, a social scientist, so I didn't have normal thought patterns to begin with. <laughs> and I, I thought to myself, why on earth am I going to suddenly love this baby that I'd never met before? I mean, more than any other person. Like, it's weird, right? It doesn't seem to make sense. And yet, people do. They don't just like leave their baby on the bus. They love the, why is that? And then, you know, my, my wife went into labor and, and, and I helped. They, they, they liked to let me think that I was helping deliver my child. They're basically keeping me out of the way. But, and I held him. He was a couple of minutes old. And he looked up into my eyes and something popped inside my head. I could feel something happen inside my brain. And I would have died for him at that very second. Same thing happened with my second and third child. My third child was adopted. 
didn't matter. The first time I laid eyes on her, she looked at me with her little black eyes and her grabbing my shirt with her fists and same thing happened again, oxytocin. It's a miracle, it's a gift from God that we bond to each other, that we, he gives us this way that we can bind to each other so thoroughly. So that's the policy mystery solved in brain chemistry, the brain chemistry of love. When you fall in love, it's oxytocin. Now, how is this related to heroin? You know, the, the, the opiate that is most abused in America today is called OxyContin. Sounds an awful lot like oxytocin. There's a reason why. The oxytocin receptors in your brain can actually be filled by the opiates and heroin and fentanyl and oxytocin and oxycontin and Percocet and Percodan and all of these illicit drugs. They actually look like the little receptors that the oxytocin fills inside your brain and as such, it makes you feel love. Somebody came up with the idea, when you've got these heroin addicts, which are, they're in agony. I mean, they just don't know how to live without the heroin. Somebody came up with the idea that if we could administer synthetic oxytocin nasally, intranasally, maybe we could cut cravings. And sure enough, you can cut cravings for heroin by more than 50% by just giving somebody a love molecule nasal spray. It's amazing. God is so good. The creation is so unbelievable. You know, it's, I was telling, you know, Ready, to, getting ready to talk about this, and, and I was talking to my wife about the miracle of oxytocin. She said, you know, it's actually not just how you bond to your babies. It's also actually really good for raising teenagers. Because our kids are teenagers now. And I said, how so? And she said, it keeps us from killing them. <laughs> if we want a better life, and we want to solve our nation's problems, we need to focus on love. This is the bottom line. I'm persuaded. I bet you are too. So what I want to do in the balance of my time tonight, for the next half hour or so, is I want to look at a couple of our biggest problems today, not as a policy analyst, but through the lens of love, and see what we can do about it, and see how I can empower every person in this auditorium tonight to be an agent of greater love and solve America's biggest problems in the process. Let's see if we can do that. So problem number one. Problem number one is a decline in romantic love. I bet you didn't know that. That's true. I was looking at these data, you know, it's what I do all day, I run a think tank. And I was looking at these data about three years ago that looked really encouraging to me. I saw a definite downtrend in sexually transmitted infections. I saw a big downtrend in unplanned pregnancies and unwanted pregnancies. I saw a big downtrend in abortions. I said, this is great. This is great, great news. And then I found out why this was happening, which is that people aren't falling in love, aren't dating. They're, a lot of the bad things aren't happening because of this, but it's also correlated with the other things that we find, particularly among people in their 20s, which is massive increases in depression, massive increases in anxiety, and big spikes in suicide. Loneliness, all of this stuff is coming together. Why is that, why is that? There's a psychologist at San Diego State University, her name is Jean Twenge. She wrote a big book, a famous book called you know, iGen, iGen, right, what's iGen? iGen are people who are right after the millennials, and she, she's the first one who's really studied the psychological profile of people who were born around the time of my kids. In, you know, 1998, 2000, 2002, thereabouts. And what she wants to know is how their social relationships differ from those of people in past generations. She also has looked a lot at millennials, people in their 20s and early 30s, how they differ from me. <laughs> and what she's found is pretty bad news, actually. She's found, for example, that the average, in, in 1989, the average high school senior had an 85% chance of dating. Hmm? An 85% chance of going out on at least one date in your senior year in high school in 1989. This year, 56%. A 30, a 29% percentage point drop in the likelihood of dating for high school seniors. Everybody my age and older went out on a date on your high, in your high school senior year or you had a really, really hardcore harsh dad, right? <laughs> That's because it was normal behavior. 
You'd think that a society that's more secular, that's more permissive, that's more licentious, that has lower moral standards, would be more dating. There's less. So I looked into it a little bit more. People in their 20s today are about a third less likely to be in love than people were in the 1980s when I was that age. Less likely to be in love. This is bad, right? Look, love's the nuclear fuel of happiness. Less romantic love means less happiness. This explains a lot of the mental health trends that we see today, just as Jean Twenge um, explained, explains in her new book. All of the, all of the, uh, the data reinforce this. In the 1980s, 32% of people in their 20s were married. Th right this year, 19% are married. And by the way, it's not because they're cohabitating, because cohabitation is down as well. People are simply not romantically related in the way that they were in the past. I, my, I, my, my oldest son, he's 21 now. He's not a teenager anymore, thank God. <laughs> he's a junior at Princeton University. Doing great. Really, he's really having a good time. I, I had all these dated. I said, is this true? Is this true? He said, oh, yeah, no one dates. Hmm. No one dates. I mean, that's a strong statement. I'm sure that's not entirely true. But in his experience and in his friend group, there just aren't romantic relationships. Why? Why is this? Because then that becomes the next question, isn't it? Why would this be true? Jean Twenge, the psychologist I talked about a minute ago, she's got the obvious answer. Social media, right? Because that's, the, that's the, 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 the culprit for everything these days. You don't like something? Twitter, that's the problem. <laughs> Facebook, Instagram, that's what's killing everybody all the time, right? So anything you don't like, blame it on social media, and you're probably people go, that's right. In this case, Gene Twenge says it's absolutely true. Why? Because a virtual relationship is a counterfeit substitute for a real relationship. If you want to fight, if you go to a family of mom, dad, and junior, and the family's having horrible problems, they can't get along, the first thing that a family counselor will do is they will look at what they call the dyads inside the family. Mom, dad, their relationship. Dad, junior, their relationship. Mom, junior. There are three dyads in a three-person family. You can figure that out in any size family. More people, more dyads, right? You're going to find a, a dysfunctional dyad in every family that's not getting along. Okay, now, the problem with social media is in substituting for real human relationships, it creates dysfunctional links between people. And she says that that leads to loneliness, and then to depression, and then to anxiety, and she's convinced that the rise of social media is creating a spike in teen and 20-something suicides. Bad news, social media. Second, a second reason, there's an increasingly hostile uh, adversarial relationship that we see between men and women, particularly young men and women. There's a, I write a column for the Washington Post, and in the paper that I write for, uh, a professor of women's studies at a highly esteemed university in the Northeast wrote a, an op-ed recently entitled, Why Can't We Hate Men? It was a rhetorical question, because the obvious answer is, of course, you can, and you should. That's what the article said. When on our college campuses, we're telling men and women that they should be suspicious and hostile toward each other, saying, I hate you, does not exactly set romantic hearts ablaze. <laughs> and that's problematic, and we do see that. It's increasingly occurring. The data show more and more hostility between men and women, particularly those in their 20s and 30s. Certainly more than people my generation and those of you who are my age. Now, those are compelling reasons, but here's the killer. Here's the real reason, as far as I'm concerned. Here's the most compelling reason of all. You want to know what drives out love? Fear. The ultimate negative emotion. St. John, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. People say, what's the opposite of love? Hate, wrong. Hate comes from fear. Where there is fear, there can't be love. To conquer fear, you must love. So therefore, if you find an environment where there is not enough love, you will axiomatically find an environment where there is too much fear. And that's exactly what we find among young people today. The most fearful generation since we've been keeping records. You know, it's, there's a great new book that just came out by a, a friend of mine who teaches at the university, uh, at New York University, at the Stern School of Business. He's a psychologist named Jonathan Haidt. 
And he wrote a book with Greg Lukianoff, uh, who, who, who runs a, a free speech organization for universities. And their book is called The Coddling of the American Mind. The main point of the book is that universities, most universities, this is a real oasis, by the way, Wheaton College. But in the university environment, you have people who are, we're just not treating kids in a way that's getting them ready for real life. The coddling of the American mind is not exposing people to ideological diversity, not, not, not getting people to, to disagree with each other sufficiently, and such that they come out of college just not ready for real life, which is actually kind of risky and scary and adversarial. That's the point of the book. Now, for my money, the most interesting part of this book, however, is all the ways that they chart that people my age, my generation, are wrecking people of the next generation by not letting them grow up at all. So they show trends, for example. So they'll say, I've seen them actually talk about their book. They'll get in front of an audience and they'll say, okay, when I count to three, everybody for, at 40 and over, say the age at which you first went out without your parents' supervision to do an errand, out of the house, completely out of the house, or when you first walked to school all by yourself. Counts to three, and people say five, six, right? Now he says everybody under 30, and they say 13 or 14. How is it that when crime has been falling in America, parents have not been letting their kids out? And, and by the way, I'm super guilty you know, my little girl was turning 16 this month. I mean, I don't want her to go out still. Lock and key, man. You know, it's so different than, you know, when I, when I was growing up, I was growing up in Seattle, literally in, in, in the neighborhood where Ted Bundy was abducting women, right, in my, in my neighborhood. Like in the, and and it, it's, I had a paper route at 4.30 in the morning, right? And, uh, you know, every morning, all by myself, you know, on the paper route, really dark and the whole thing. And I remember my dad, you know, reading the paper, and Ted Bundy is running amok, right? And he says, you know, my dad was a, had a PhD in statistics. And he says, you know, the odds are very low that you would be in his demographic, <laughs> right? <laughs> so you can keep the route. Now, <laughs> that's, that's free-range parenting, <laughs> right? That's not what we do. I am super lucky because I've have no fear. I don't have fear of things. I mean, bad things have befallen me, and they certainly will in the future. But, but when kids are not exposed to being able to take care of themselves, they, 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 we inculcate more fear. There's a lot of evidence in, in Lukianoff and, and Haidt's book also that, that we adjudicate our kids' disputes. They go take the kid to the play date, and oh, little Johnny shouldn't be hitting little Bobby, and, and, and his parents do this more than they used to. Uh, schools, high schools, don't let disputes happen. We have way more about anti-bullying than we've ever had in the past, such that, you know, bullying is bad, but learning how to stick up for yourself without a parent intervening is really important too. And th then we get to college. And what do we find in college? Safe spaces, trigger warnings, banning speakers because they say controversial things. That's insane. You go to college to get challenge. You go to college to hear scary things. You go to college to hear new things. And if you're not hearing scary things, and you're not hearing risky things, and you're not being offended, you're not getting a good education. You're not going to graduate ready for life. And so they come out with the social equivalent of a peanut allergy <laughs> at 22. Guess what? They're afraid of risk. They're afraid to fall in love. They're afraid to get rejected. They're afraid of life. And that's what we see in the data. That's bad, because that leads people to avoid the most important love connection they'll ever make in their life, save for the love of God. And that's the romantic love that they can have for each other that starts a family. That's on its way down. Hmm. Now, I know for a fact that taking risk in love brings happiness. Scary, like the scariest thing ever, right? All of us know that, we've fallen in love, but it brings happiness. There's a study that shows this, and I just love this study. <clears throat> it's by Stephen Levitt, the economist at the University of Chicago down the street. Uh, he's super famous for those of you who are students who sort of know his name but don't quite know who he is. He wrote Freakonomics, this massive bestseller from 10 years ago. And the reason that Stephen Levitt is a great economist is not because he has better economics technique than the rest of us, it's because he asks better questions. And one of the questions he's been asking recently is, how do people make hard decisions? 
Do they tend to say yes to scary things too much or no by not doing scary things too much? All of you, the data say that about a third of you right now are in agony over some life decision where you don't know what to do. It could go either way. Yes is a scary thing and no is sort of the status quo, but either could be right, you don't know what to do so you're sort of paralyzed. If that's not you right now, it was recently or it will be soon. It's life. So Steve Levitt wants to know, when you're presented with a conundrum, yes, no, whether you tend to say yes too much or no too much. Do we take the risky yes too much or we stay with the safe no too much? So how does he answer this question? It's ingenious, this is why this guy is one of the greatest economists of his time. He, 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 he puts out an advertisement saying, are you suffering from the agony of a hard life decision? Whether it's a romantic decision, should I break up with my girlfriend or ask her to marry me? Should I, you know, should I get that trick knee fixed? Should I go to law school? Should I drop out of college? That stuff. He says, are you struggling with a decision and you're in agony over it? Let me make the decision for you by, with the flip of a coin. <laughs> and 26,000 people signed up for his experiment. God bless America, right? I mean, it's, it's amazing. Like, I can't decide whether to propose to my girlfriend, so I'm going to let an economist at the University of Chicago flip a quarter. I mean, it's just crazy. <laughs> 26,000 Americans. Okay, so they send in their decisions, and he plugs them into his system. He has a lot of research assistants doing this. A computer flips coins and sends back their decisions. Yes, do it. Do the scary thing. No, don't do it. Okay? Now, here's the ingenious part. He actually, he, 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 he self-tests people's happiness before, like one to 10. How happy are you in your life? One to 10. One is misery, 10 is bliss. And then he tests them again a year after the experiment. And he finds that the yeses are an entire digit happier than the noes. Incredibly statistically significant. You never find results like this. And why is this? Again, these were like a drug test, treatment and control. A computer decided whether you were going to take the yes versus the no, and the yeses were systematically much happier than the noes. These were, a lot of these were decisions about love, about giving your heart away. This has had a big impact on me. You know, I work at AEI, and I have a lot of young people working with me. And I'll, we'll talk to these young guys, you know, these young guys. And DC is the most dysfunctional dating market on the planet. <laughs> I'll talk to these young men, and you know, guys in the late 30s. And you'll know, say, how are things going? They'll say, well, you haven't been going out with this girlfriend for a while. It's great. How long have you been going out with her? It's like eight years, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes they'll say, what do you think I ought to do? And usually what they mean is, what should I do with my career, right? But that's not really what they want advice on. They want to be happy. So if I really give them advice, it's like, you want advice? I want you to go home and put on your favorite music for an hour. Then I want you to say a prayer, and I want you to go to your girlfriend's house and get down on one knee. And you're going to hope that she says yes. And you're going to say yes to your own heart. That's what I think you ought to do. And I have the data to show that you'll be happier, because I'm a social scientist. <clears throat> You gotta take a risk with your heart. You gotta be an entrepreneur with your heart. That's a startup life. Hmm. So, <laughs> I was given a talk, and I was talking about this study right after I read it, a couple years ago, in Washington, D.C., for a big group of young people, all in their 20s. <clears throat> I talked about this study, and I said this. I said, look, a bunch of you think you're a bunch of entrepreneurs, you're gonna start a company, you're gonna venture capital. You're not entrepreneurs, you're weak, because you're not willing to fall in love. And until you give your heart away, you're not an entrepreneur. Okay? I thought it was pretty clever. And a couple weeks later, after that speech, I'm, I'm on a plane, because I'm sort of always on a plane, and, and uh, a guy comes up the aisle, and he stops him by, and he says, are you, are you Dr. Brooks? And I said, yeah. And he says, I was at that speech you gave where you said that real entrepreneurs take risks with their heart. I said, yeah. And he said, I can't get it out of my head. So I'm on my way right now to tell a girl I'm in love with her, and I've been in love with her for two years, and I've been afraid to tell her. I'm gonna ask her to make a commitment to me. I'm gonna live a startup life, man. And I said, it was only a speech. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, that's a lot of pressure. Said a little prayer for him, you know. I didn't see him for a couple of months after that. But I saw him a few months later at AEI. We had a Christmas party. He showed up to the Christmas party, and I remembered that guy's face, and I went up to him in a beeline for him. I said, remember me? He says, oh, I remember you. 
I said, you were on your way to declare your love for that girl to give your heart away. <laughs> How'd it go? <laughs> he said, she shot me down with total prejudice. She didn't shoot me down. That night, she got together with her old boyfriend, and she told me about it. It was horrible. And I was very contrite. I said, I'm sorry. He said, no way. I mean, I've been meaning to send you an email to thank you. I said, thank me? What, so you some sort of masochist? <laughs> he said, no, no. You see, I was super afraid to do that, and I was paralyzed by that fear. And you encouraged me to say what, I, say what was written on my heart, and I did. And you know what? She shot me down, and I didn't die. I didn't die. <laughs> See, it feels like a threat all the time when you're giving your heart away. It feels so dangerous. And then you do, and it's okay. And he says, I'm never going to wonder, and I'm not going to be afraid ever again. The average startup entrepreneur in America has 3.8 company failures before his or her first success. You're not doing your job unless you have 3.8 ugly breakups before you get married, <laughs> is the bottom line, if you really are a life entrepreneur. Give your heart away. Encourage other people to do it. Don't be afraid. That's lesson number one. Now, my own entrepreneurial life really does focus on this. Um, I come from a different generation than the young people that I'm talking to, but I have a story about the way I, you know, my life progressed that's a lot like yours. When I was 24 years old, I was making my living as a French horn player. It was my whole dream, I was being a French horn player as a matter of fact, and I was on tour all the time. And on one particular concert tour, I was in the Burgundy region of France playing chamber music. And I was on stage, and I looked down over the edge of the stage, and there was this girl looking up at me, and she was smiling. And she was so pretty. And I thought, they never smile at me, so I'm going to talk to her later. <laughs> so I, I, I finished the concert, and I made a beeline for her, and I started talking to her. And she didn't understand a word I was saying, because it turned out she spoke zero English. I learned through an interpreter that she was not French. She was actually from Barcelona, from Spain. And, and you know, so I did what anybody would do, as I got an interpreter to translate to say, I want to take you to dinner. So we went to supper, and we, I don't know how we communicated, you know, hand gestures and monosyllabic, you know, trying to look for cognates, I don't know. Went out a couple of more times, and I went home after a week. And I called my dad, I couldn't get her out of my head. And I called my dad, and I said, my dad in Seattle, the statistician, and I said, Dad, I met the girl I'm going to marry. He says, great, when can I meet her? I said, well, I got some problems. <laughs> uh, problem number one is that she doesn't live on this side of the Atlantic. Um, problem number two is that she doesn't speak a word of English, and I don't speak any Spanish. And problem number three is that she doesn't know that I'm going to marry her, and this would really freak her out. <laughs> but I set about to work on this. I stayed in touch, and, and I just had this premonition. And, and maybe I, I felt a divine premonition. Because I quit my job, and I moved to Spain, and I took a job in the Barcelona Orchestra, and I set about the entrepreneurial endeavor of trying to get that girl to marry me. And my son at Princeton is her son. <laughs> Incredible. This year was our 28th wedding anniversary. That is the fruit of taking a risk with your heart. Now, when I first moved there, she was making her living as a professional singer. And uh, she was a great singer. And she, she made a good living. And she taught me a love song when I first moved to Barcelona. And she sang it to me. And anybody here speak Spanish? Let me read you the words of this love song. Señor de los espacios infinitos, tú que tienes la paz entre las manos, derrámame, Señor, te la suplico, y enséñales a amar a mis hermanos. I've learned Spanish in the meantime, 30 years later. I didn't know what that meant until some years later, however. And I translated it. I thought, what were the words of that beautiful love song? You can imagine the effect that this had on me when I was 24 years old. What were the words that she was actually singing to me? So I went back. This is what this means. Lord of the infinite, who holds peace within your hands, pour it out, O Lord, I beg of you, and show my brothers how to love one another. 
It wasn't a song of romantic love at all. <laughs> it was a song of brotherly love. It was a song of love for each other. You know, it's funny because you hear romantic love songs all the time. They don't really affect you. But I bet just now your heart skipped a beat. Because that's what we want right now. We want more brotherly love. We have some romantic love, maybe not enough. But look around you. Do you think that we have enough brotherly love? Not in the world, just in America. What if, we, what if that love song were something we actually took seriously? And that leads me to my second big crisis of love I want to talk to you about tonight and the subject of the book that's sitting out there in the lobby. That's the love that we have for each other as Americans. Um, in 2014, I read a study in the, in the, the American Review of Political Science um, by a guy named Adam Waits. He's a, he's a, he teaches right on the other side, not University of Chicago, but up the street here at Northwestern. He's a, he teaches, uh, he's a political scientist, but he does work on something called motive attribution asymmetry. What's that? That's kind of a long-haired concept. But what it means is when you have a conflict between two groups of people, motive attribution asymmetry occurs when both sides think that they are motivated by love and the other side is motivated by hatred for them. Now, when that occurs, there's no way that reconciliation is possible because the other side is the implacable foe. We're all good and they're all evil. Now, both sides can't be right when there's motive attribution and asymmetry. Both sides can be wrong, but both sides can't be right. Where do you see it? You see it in armed conflict. You see it in the Balkans. You see it in the Rwandan genocide a lot. One of the key places that we find it is in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, where both sides feel they're motivated by love, and the other side is motivated by hatred toward them. Now, why do I bring it up? Because Adam Waits finds that motive attribution asymmetry today in America, or he wrote in 2014, is statistically as great between Democrats and Republicans as it is between Israelis and Palestinians that our level of political polarization is greater than at any time since the 1850s, and you know what happened on the, on the heels of that. It wasn't just 1860, the founding of Wheaton College. It was bad stuff. It was the ultimate polarization of brother against brother, compatriot against compatriot, civil war. Okay, so that's what he finds, and, and I had this on my mind as a scholar. I thought, it can't be right. It can't be right. And, and right after that, right after I read this study, I was, a, I was doing a, a speech in, um, in New Hampshire. It's what I do for a living. I do 175 speeches a year. I don't get to do talks like this very often. I don't get to talk about love and the entrepreneurship of the heart very often. I love this, by the way. This is what I really want to be doing, right? But I was giving a talk about economic policy. It was at a, a conservative activist event. I do 175 speeches a year, so I do for a living. I love it. I'm so happy to be able to do it. And sometimes I talk to very left-wing audiences at universities, and sometimes kind of middle-of-the-road business groups, and sometimes conservative groups, like this, like this group of conservative activists in New Hampshire. 700 conservative activists, super fired up. And on the docket that day, there were about 15 speakers, one after the other, 15 minutes. I was the only one not running for president. <laughs> right? And I was looking at the thing, I was looking, I was like, like so Ted Cruz and Donald Trump and Scott Walker and, and me. That's weird, that's a mistake. Then I thought, God doesn't make mistakes. I'm here for a reason. What am I here for? I'm here to make this better. And again, I got nothing against the people that were on that schedule. I agree with a lot of the things they say that, that were on that schedule. But I know I'm not a politician, and I knew what they were going to be doing. See, what politicians do when they want to get elected to office is they get in front of the most sympathetic audience possible, and they go out and they say, you know what? You're right. And the other guys are stupid and evil. By the other guys, I mean the people who are not there because they disagree. That's what they always do. And I knew that was going to happen. And sure enough, they were throwing raw stakes into the uh, big applause lines about how stupid liberals are, how, how evil the progressives are, how dumb the Democrats are, how ignorant they are, and how everybody in that audience who was very conservative is right. Now, I didn't object to the policy positions because I'm a conservative. What I objected to was the way that they characterized the other side. So here's what I did. Here was my plan. Here's what I thought God wanted me to do. Okay? You know, woe be unto you when you think God wants you to do something at a conservative rally. But anyway, <laughs> it's like only bad things happen after that, right? <laughs> so, 
So I get out there in the middle of my speech, and I said, you know, I, I, I'm telling you things, I was in economic policy speech, yeah, I'm saying things that you agree with. Right? You've clapped a couple of times during my speech. But right now, I want you to remember the people who would not clap during the speech, because they disagree with us. Who are they? Liberals, progressives. Why are they not here? Because they're not invited. And they wouldn't come anyway because they don't agree with us. But here's what I want you to remember. They're not stupid, and they're not evil. They're simply Americans who disagree with us on public policy. And if you think you're right, your job is to persuade them with love. It was not an applause line. <laughs> but the applause line came right after that, because this lady, God bless her, she says, I think they're stupid and evil. <laughs> Big applause for that lady, not for me, right? OK, so, so I start thinking. I start thinking to myself, you know, there's a weird things that they pop into your head sometimes. And I thought I've seen it all, because you know, 175 speeches a year, I see a lot of different stuff. And, and what popped into my head, though, was not what I was expecting, because I started thinking about Seattle. I already told you, it's my hometown. You know, my, my, uh, Seattle's the most left-wing city in America. You already knew that. My mother was a, an artist. My father was a college professor, right? Notwithstanding his origins at Wheaton College, you can guess what my parents' politics were. Seattle college professor, artists. I'm the black sheep of the family, because I'm a political conservative. You know, I was the, I'm the only one in, among all my family and all my friends. Let me tell you something about my parents. Not stupid, not evil. Fantastic parents. Really good values, preparing me for the world, valuing education. <laughs> that lady was insulting my mom. And I took it personally. Big epiphany for me, you know? My dad used to say, the mark of moral courage is not standing up to people with whom you disagree. That's a good thing to do sometimes. I mean, you know, if somebody says something you disagree with, fine, disagree. You know, this is the competition of ideas, fundamental to a free society. This is America. But that's not a mark of moral courage. The mark of moral courage is standing up to people with whom you agree on behalf of those with whom you disagree. That's real moral courage to say, look, I agree with you, but don't talk that way about people who are not in our presence. And that's exactly what we don't do in America today, because we lack brotherly love. And that's the crisis we have to solve. So what's the crisis? Why are we doing that? You know, people often say that we're too uncivil or that we're too intolerant. That's wrong. Those are garbage standards. If I told you that my wife and I that we're civil to each other, <laughs> you'd say we need counseling. <laughs> If I told you that my employees at the American Enterprise Institute, they tolerate me, you'd say I have a big morale problem on my hands, right? By the way, if I said that we have a big disagreement problem, we need to agree more, that's wrong too. This is a country based on competition, political competition, economic competition, and an idea competition, also known as disagreement. We've got to disagree, or we become mediocre, we become soft. Agreement, except in very narrow cases, is usually not what we want to get better. So the goal is not civility, the goal is not tolerance, the goal is not agreement, and the problem isn't even anger. You know, people always say we're so angry because we're yelling at each other all the time. You watch cable TV yelling at each other constantly. That's not it either. See, anger is a hot emotion that says, I care what you think about. I care what you think about something and I want to change it. That's a good thing. There is literally no correlation between anger and separation and divorce among married couples. You know, when you're married to a Spaniard, that's really good news. <laughs> that why have I been married for 28 years? Because of the lack of correlation between anger and divorce. <laughs> what is the killer of love relationships, of brotherly love and also marriage? It's when you take anger and you mix in disgust. That becomes a toxic compound, like putting ammonia in with bleach and getting chlorine gas. It's, it's what we call contempt. Contempt is the conviction of the utter worthlessness of another person. When you express contempt for somebody, you will have an enemy. You just will. People never quite forget it when they're treated with contempt. Now, back to the analogy with the married couple. I have a friend named John Gottman who teaches at the University of Washington in Seattle. 
John Gottman is the world's leading expert on marital reconciliation. He's brought thousands of couples back together again who are on the brink of divorce. He has a, a laboratory called the Gottman Marriage Laboratory. It is the most successful thing I've ever seen in systematically bringing quarreling couples together and getting them back together in love. Now, it's, it's amazing. And by the way, that guy, this guy's a hero. Yeah, everybody knows, everybody, all of you know that the basis of every successful society is strong families. The basis of strong families is loving couples that stay together. That's just true. Anybody who can prevent a divorce and keep people in love helps them, helps our country, and helps the world, and probably helps get them into heaven. That's my hero. I love John Gottman for that. Okay, so John Gottman says he can predict, after talking to a couple for just a few minutes, he can predict if they will be divorced within three years with 94% accuracy. Hmm, you want to know what he's looking for, right? Eye rolling. The ultimate sign of contempt. Uh, oh. You know, with teenage kids, you see it all the time. They, they fall backwards in their chairs practically from their, you know, rolling their eyes so hard, right? But, but that doesn't really count because that's just sort of the persona. When somebody who's your spouse or your coworker or your friend or just somebody who owes you respect as a, as a fellow citizen rolls their eyes or makes a sarcastic joke or derisive humor or just dismisses you, when they treat you and your ideas as worthless, you're never going to forget it. John Gottman said, that's the problem with politics in America. The world's leading expert in marital reconciliation gave me advice on how to bring America back together again by treating us like a big married couple. <laughs> Stop treating each other with contempt. He's persuaded, and I'm persuaded as well. By the way, this is not just a moral problem of insulting my mom. This is an incredibly practical problem, too. Nobody in history has ever been convinced with insults. I hate you will never bring people to your point of view. You're worthless will never persuade anybody. And yet we act as if we could. We act as if rolling your eyes makes you somehow more persuasive. It makes exactly the opposite. People will be less persuaded in every case. So if you want more love, if you want more happiness, if you want to be more persuasive, and you want to unite America, you have one goal, which is to declare war on contempt. How do you fix it? Now, to begin with, do you do it? I do. When I started this research, I went back and looked at a little archival footage of myself on TV. I knew a lot of TV. And I was debating some lady on CNN, and I rolled my eyes. I'm guilty. My friends, I'm a sinner. <laughs> and you know what she didn't do, I guarantee you? didn't go home and said to somebody in your family, you know, I was debating this guy from the American Enterprise Institute, and he was making some very good points. I guaranteed, she said, what a jerk. And you know what? She was right. I was a jerk to do that. Because I made an enemy needlessly. I told somebody with one little gesture that that person was worthless and their ideas were useless. I didn't mean it. I didn't mean that. I don't think that. So why did I do it? Why did you do it last time you did it? And the answer is, you have a habit. We have habits of communication. Countries get into habits of communications. So I asked John Gottman, the marriage guy, why do couples treat each other with contempt? Do they hate each other? He says, no, they actually love each other. They just have to remind, they have to remember not to act as if they didn't love each other. It's weird. They get into habits of treating each other with contempt even though they don't feel real contempt. Extraordinary, isn't it? Bad habits lead to bad results. Contempt in a marriage is like smoking five packs of cigarettes a day. You're going to pay. Sooner or later, that habit is going to come up and get you. So what do you need to do? You need to break the habit. He has ways to do this with couples. How do we do it as a country? How can you do it as a person? You know, when I'm talking about brotherly love and bringing the country together, I'm kind of an institutionalist by nature. I write books about governments and policies and people and people in power and all that. This is not the solution. The solution is not better politicians, and it's not better governments, and it's not better policy. The solution is my own heart. Look, I can't bring the whole country together again, but I can do a tiny little bit to subvert the culture of contempt and be more persuasive and be happier as a person. It's a win-win-win if I simply declare war on my own contempt and solve that problem by breaking the habit. Now, for everybody, it's not a habit. 
I have data that show that 93% of Americans hate how divided we've become as a country. Hate it. For them, they do, who, they're expressing contempt because we all do it. It's a habit. For the other 7% who don't hate how divided we become as a country, it's not a habit, it's a way of life. That's what we call the outrage industrial complex. That's the group of Americans that are profiting with fame and power and glory and clicks and followers and satisfaction and just getting their jollies from making people hate each other on the internet and on television and on college campuses all over America. They're trying to set American against American. But I'm not talking about the 7% because they don't, 7% is not in this room. We're in the 93% and we need to fight back. So how do we do it? How do we break the habit? How do you break any habit? Have you ever had a bad habit? Of course you have, we all do. The way you break a bad habit is pretty simple, but you have to know the science behind it. Okay? Now all habits have one thing in common. They employ a part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. That's a part of the brain about the size of the end of your pinky finger. It's deep inside your brain and it governs your reward behavior, not your your conscious mind. So your, your prefrontal cortex, the meaty part of your brain right behind your, your forehead, your prefrontal cortex, that's all your conscious stuff. You know, I'm going to go to a lecture by that guy from Washington, D.C. at Wheaton College tonight. That's your prefrontal cortex talking. To do something where you automatically do anything, that's your nucleus accumbens. And that's a reward center saying, that felt good once, do it again. That felt good twice, do it again. And it gets harder and harder to break because you're doing this part, you're using this part of your brain that's bypassing your prefrontal cortex. So how do you change that? The answer is you reprogram your nucleus accumbens by stopping every time you get a particular stimulus and choosing a new action. In other words, substituting a new behavior for the old one. So if you're a smoker, for example, right? You can say to yourself, okay, I'm not gonna smoke, I'm not gonna smoke, I'm not, willpower, I'm not gonna smoke, you're gonna smoke. Right? You need to put something else in this place every time you want to smoke. Get up, walk around the block, drink a glass of water, drink alcohol. <laughs> that's, not, that's not actually what you should do. So <clears throat> uh, um, you, you need to substitute one behavior, better behavior for the old one, right? So the key is when you feel contempt rising in you because somebody says something, the dumbest thing you've ever heard, and you want to roll your eyes or you want to behave contemptuously, whether it's on the internet, on social media, or in the comments section after your favorite newspaper, or whether it's uh, simply at the television or even at the Thanksgiving table when your uncle or your aunt says something you find offensive and ignorant, what are you going to do instead? You feel the stimulus. Typically, by the way, you feel contempt because somebody treats you with contempt. You react. You stop and you behave a different way. First, get as much space between the stimulus and response as you can. The Buddhist masters always talk about increasing the space between stimulus and response, right? Now, your mother was a Buddhist master. How do I know that? Because she told you to count to 10 when you feel angry before you respond. Same idea. You get a stimulus, wait, choose the reaction that you want no matter how you feel. Because you're not the slave to your feelings. You're the master of your feelings. What should you do instead? What should you do instead? I asked the wisest man I know, one of my great teachers and friends, believe it or not, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I've worked with the Dalai Lama for the past seven years. It's a very unlikely friendship. He's Buddhist, I'm Christian. He's a man of the East, I'm a man of the West. But we've been working together, we've been writing together. Maybe some of you have seen the things we've written together in the New York Times and the Washington Post. We've also done a lot of programs together. And while we were shooting that movie you just saw the trailer for, he was in it. The world's leading Tibetan, Tibetan Buddhist, actually the world's most respected single religious figure today. I asked him between takes in that movie, because I was thinking about this. I said, your holiness, what should I do when I feel contempt? What should I do instead? And he said, show warm heartedness. <coughs> and I thought, you got anything else? <coughs> Because, you know, that sounds kind of weak. But then I thought about it more. See, the Dalai Lama, he was, as some of you may know, those of you who don't know his story, he was exiled from Tibet at the age of 24 as the leader of the Tibetan people. He, was, he led his people, into, he led the leaders of the Tibetans into exile. They were rolled over by naked Chinese communist aggression. A tiny nation of six million people across a vast landmass. All of the leaders were kicked out in poverty, be, disappeared and forgotten. Like so many people around the world, this is how power always works. This is how naked aggression always works. And yet, weird, weird thing of all weird things, that was 60 years ago. I'm in 
Wheaton, Illinois, on a stage at Wheaton College talking about His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Why do I know about him? Why is he the world's most respected religious figure? <laughs> because of warm-heartedness in the face of contempt. That's his secret to success. I've never heard him publicly and never heard him privately say a single word of contempt about the Chinese leaders. Look, these are the people that killed his compatriots, took away his homeland, drove him into exile and poverty. And he starts every day praying for the Chinese leaders, loving his enemies, praying not that they'll give him back his homeland, but they'll live good and happy lives and they will know truth. That was rewarded with the cause of the Tibetan people, which I proudly advocate and I recommend to you as well. A case of human rights, a case of justice, a case of religious freedom, which I've taken up. I would not have even known who the Dalai Lama is had it not been for his warm-heartedness in the face of contempt. That's strength. See, answering contempt with contempt, that's for weak people. Answering contempt with warm-heartedness, that's for strong people who are the master of themselves. That's what we need to do. So I asked him, Your Holiness, what if I don't feel warm-hearted? And you know what he told me? He told me to fake it. <laughs> now, it turns out there's a huge psychological basis for this thing. If you fake it, it turns out it works. Why? Because attitude follows action, not vice versa. You want to feel more gratitude? Act more grateful. You want to feel happier? Make yourself smile. You want to be more warm-hearted? Act more warm-hearted. So I said, how do I, how do, I do that? And he said, remember a time when somebody treated you with hatred and when you answered with love by accident. Don't remember the circumstances. Remember how it set your heart on fire and remember the feeling and you will recreate the right actions. This once again is a very important psychological principle. Remember the feeling and the action will follow. Choose the action and the feeling will follow. It's the opposite side of the same, uh, the same phenomenon. So I went back to my little room and I remembered a time, I sat down, I prayed about it, to remember a time when somebody treated me with hatred and I accidentally answered with, with love. And I want to tell you about it, because it had a big impact on me. And I want you to remember your experience if you want to put this into action. My experience was in 2006, where you know, I was still a professor at Syracuse University. I was very happy. You know, I had great students, uh, I liked my classes, I wrote lots of academic journal articles and books that nobody ever read because they were very boring. And something changed my life all of a sudden. I it turns out I wrote a book and it was just as boring as everything else. I expected it to sell, you know, you know literally dozens of copies. And um, it was full of math and technical appendices and graphs and charts. And, uh, and then something happened, which happens to professors sometimes, where the news cycle hits your research agenda in exactly the right way at the right moment, lightning strikes. And my book started selling hundreds of copies a day. President Bush read it and talked about it, invited me to the White House. And, and, and then I wound up on television talking about it. And it was, it was about charitable giving, about who gives more to charity, religious people or secular people, conservative people or liberal people, poor people or rich people. And everything you think you know about it turns out to be wrong which made it kind of an interesting, controversial book for some people. But I wasn't expecting this. So I was on TV and radio and started getting feedback from people who read my book that I'd never met before. And it turns out when you have a book that's on, a, on the bestseller list, people read it and, and they, they write you email and they tell you about their lives because they think they know you because they read your book. But you don't know them, so it's very disconcerting. And if they don't like your book, they don't like you and they tell you that. So I get an email from a guy three weeks after the book comes out, and now people have finished the book and they're sending me. I'm getting hundreds of emails, and I'm reading them. And so a guy writes to me and says, Dear Professor Brooks, you are a right-wing fraud. Which is a tough way to start email, <laughs> especially if you want somebody to read your email. But I did. I was a good sport. And I noticed this email is 5,000 words long. It's going to take me 20 minutes to read. Wow. And, and, and I get into the email, and this guy's refuting every fact in my book. Every chart, every line, every conclusion, every survey, every study. It's amazing, detailed. The columns in table 3.1 are reversed, you moron. Stuff like that. It's like, wow, <laughs> this guy's good. And I became conscious of my feelings 15 minutes in. You know what I was feeling over and over again? Feeling. He read my book. <laughs> <laughs> I was filled with gratitude because nobody ever, my family didn't read my books. Nobody read my books. 
I could barely read my books. And so I wrote back to the guy. I said, you know, I know you hate my book and you think I'm a stooge and you think it's terrible and everything's terrible. I got it. But you read my book and it took me two years to write that thing and I put my whole heart into it. I'm so grateful to you right now. Thank you. Send. <laughs> and then I go back to work, right? And probably never hear from the guy. 15 minutes later, ding, his email's back up, and I'm thinking, uh-oh. I mean, he probably wants to kill me now or something. I don't know. So I open his email. You know what it says? Dear Professor Brooks, next time you're in Dallas, if you want to get some dinner, give me a call. <laughs> and I thought, what, what just happened? And what had happened was that I had answered his contempt, his pure unbridled contempt with a sincere expression of gratitude, of warm-heartedness. And that gratitude anesthetized his contempt. He didn't suddenly think he liked my book. He still hated my book, but he realized he liked me. <laughs> and that was more powerful. Why? Because I don't need to make a connection between my book and that guy. I need to make a connection between me and that guy. That's what it's all about. That's how you bring a country together, not through agreement, because agreement's for chumps, agreement's for patsies, agreement's for weak countries. Disagreement with love is what's dignified for the United States of America. And that gratitude that I had to him was completely appropriate. That guy actually read my book and told me about it. What flattering is that? It's completely amazing. We take so much for granted in this country. You know, I, I talk to the I talk to the Congress, I go to their annual retreat for members. It's a very great privilege of my job to be able to keynote the retreat for members of Congress every year. And one of the things I'll often ask is, how many of you wish we lived in a one-party state? Zero hands. How many of you are grateful to live in a country where we have a multi-party democracy? All the hands. Okay, you just told me that you're grateful for the other party. By axiom, you've told me that you're, if, you, if you love living in a country where people can disagree, where there's no knock in the night, no jackbooted thug, you must exercise that disagreement, which means you are, you're, you're not just grateful to live in the country, you're grateful for the people who live in the country who are in disagreement with you. How ungrateful are we that we can't remember that? That gratitude is the beginning of the brotherly love that we need because that is the warm-heartedness with which we can answer contempt. That's the secret, my friends. Next time you're treated with contempt, which if you talk about politics, will be in the next 20 minutes. <laughs> if you go on social media, it's the next 20 seconds. That's your opportunity. That's your salvation that comes when you love your enemies. You know it's true. The subversive truth of Matthew 5, what is it? It isn't love your friends, love your kids. I was going to say, that's easy, but, you know, i got teenagers, so it's not so easy. Anyway, so it, love the people close to you. No, 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 no. The subversive truth of Matthew 5, is that salvation comes, happiness comes, persuasion comes, unity comes when we destroy the illusion that people are our enemies by loving them. And the only way we get to exercise that God-given privilege is when we're treated with contempt and we answer it with that warm-heartedness. Pray for the skill and the, the forbearance and the presence of mind and the intestinal fortitude and the attention that when you're treated with contempt, that you will answer with warm-heartedness. That's the answer to what we need as a country. But more importantly, it's the answer to what's written in your heart. One final word of gratitude. You know, um, the most incredible thing that I can, that has ever happened to me is being able to have a career where I can actually go places and meet people and uh, hundreds of times a year talk about love and gratitude and happiness a and I make my living doing this. I would not be able to make my living doing this if you weren't here. There'd be no audience, there'd be no market, there'd be no need and I wouldn't get to do this. So my real gratitude is to you for making it possible, to you for using some of these ideas. To the young people, the two-thirds of you who are students in this room who are going to, if I did my job, make a commitment to be an entrepreneur, to risk your hearts, to live a startup life, to fall in love, to subvert the tendencies of our time and love each other fully. And all the rest of us, when we're treated with the contempt that comes in our world that's 
surrounding us, that's being sold to us constantly by the outrage industrial complex, that we fight back. We, like the hippies in the 60s used to say, stand up to the man by fighting back, not with contempt of our own, but with a love that's in our hearts that God tells us to exhibit, to, to show, and it is our privilege to show because it's the source of our own happiness. I'm grateful to you for taking these lessons to heart. I'm grateful to you for listening to me tonight. And I'm grateful to you for what you're going to do as you leave these ro this room tonight and enter mission territory of love. God bless you and thank you.